I'm the uh, CEO of a company called Penn Foster, which is based out of Boston, Massachusetts in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, Penn Foster is actually the original correspondence school in the United States. It was actually founded in 1890, and its premise was that <coughs> there was a need for middle skilled education and that uh, the traditional markets weren't serving people properly, and that was back in 1890. Over the last 124 years, uh, the company has stayed true to that promise of trying to help middle skilled people. And obviously in a more contemporary context, uh, education means many different things. And we're going to talk about that uh, for much of the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, the importance of the background on Penn Foster, as you'll hear in a moment, is uh, the context of our students. And uh, we're very fortunate today to have three of our students joining us and each one of them will introduce themselves in just a minute. But just some context on this morning's discussion. The theme of it is what we call the passport for learning, which is uh, not a literal notion, but a kind of a metaphor for how we think about education. And our premise is really twofold. One is that increasingly people are going to be coming in and out of the education economy over the next 30, 40, 50 years of their careers. And in particular, the middle skilled marketplace, which is where we tend to focus, which is about 75 million Americans that have an associate degree or less, those folks in particular are going to have to have different kinds of on-ramps and off-ramps for them to remain relevant and contemporary as job markets change. And so what we've tried to do in our organization and others like us is to try to better respond to this underserved, large, growing, and acutely important market segment called the non-traditional learner, the middle skilled worker, and ultimately in many cases, but not all cases, the at-risk learner. And so what we're going to spend our time talking about today is how this idea of the passport for learning, which is the on-ramp off-ramp concept, and in particular applied to the middle skilled marketplace, is really an important part of the conversation about education and one that candidly is not getting as much attention as it deserves and will become a more important part of how education is changing. And so the folks here today will uh, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they've experienced, how it's transformed their lives, hopefully debunk some of the myths and bring a little bit more facts to some of the theories that some have propagated. And uh, hopefully you'll leave the conversation a little better informed, and I have no uncertainty, more inspired by the folks that we've brought in today. And so I'd like to introduce uh, three people. Uh, first to the left is uh, Erica, then John, and DJ, and each one of those folks will give you a little bit of background on who they are. Erica? My name is Erica Vinson. I'm from Enterprise, Alabama. I graduated in January, <coughs> excuse me, with an associate degree in veterinary technology. I graduated cum laude. I'm currently working at Auburn University Veterinary College, sorry, Auburn University College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm an emergency room technician. Um, the one word that I've chosen to describe my experience with online education has been opportunity. It has given me the opportunity to pursue a lifelong dream. Great. John? Yeah, my name is uh, John Cardno. Um, I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug addict from uh, Gardner, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm also uh, currently a substance abuse counselor for a six months residential program for adult males, 21 years of age and older. Um, I currently enrolled in uh, Penn Foster about a year ago, the high school diploma program, online education. And uh, prior to that, I, I pretty much uh, gave up on all hopes, but uh, it opened up a lot of doors for me, and, and that's why I use hope. It opened up a lot of doors for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. DJ? My name is DJ Nara Thomas. I'm from East Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, and I graduated from Penn Foster College in July of 2013. I graduated from their early education, pro early education program, and I teach in King of Prussia, PA, at Toddler Town Learning Center. Um, if I had to choose one word to sum up my online experience, it would be a miracle. I got to go to college. That's great. So maybe we can just take a little bit more insight into each one of your stories and talk about how the education experience has worked and start with a very basic question, which is each of you had your own situations prior to joining uh, an online experience for school. What were some of the big obstacles that you were having to navigate in your lives? And maybe start with DJ, if I could. What were the kinds of things that were impeding your ability to pursue education prior to going to school online? Uh, well, I my mother struggled with addiction uh, while I was very young. So I had to deal with that and take care of my younger siblings and basically be the parent of the house, holding down three jobs at a time and trying to still go to school. 
Yeah, that yeah. sounds like a, a non-trivial problem. John, you want to talk a little about some of the obstacles you had as you were thinking about going to school? Yeah, I, um, I've always struggled with school uh, throughout my life. Uh, I actually never even completed like the seventh grade. Uh, and uh, I struggled with education and addiction most of my life. And uh, there was uh, several times in my life I tried uh, like GED programs. I, I went back to school. I didn't start to learn to read and write till I was like 34 years old. And uh, when I went back uh, to school a couple of times, it's just hard because I, I, I had a hard time with like distractions around me. And uh, I find that being online, doing my, uh, I can do it at my own time, my own pace. Uh, you know, I get home from work at 10 o'clock at night. I, I can go on the computer 2 o'clock in the morning and I, I can concentrate and I absorb a lot more and uh, I attain a lot more. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I got in this program uh, a year ago on the 28th of last month. And uh, I only have five electives left to do. That's to great. Complete it. So let me uh, just pick up on a couple of parts. So if you think about the decision to go back to school, there's an economic decision, there's a time decision, there's a confidence question, which is can I actually do it, uh, given all the different headwinds you have in your lives. Um, so as you, as you thought about um, going to school again, Erica, how were you thinking about how maybe the online experience might help you navigate some of those obstacles that you were having to, to work through? The biggest question in my mind when I started looking for uh, a degree program in veterinary technology was the accreditation. Um, we as veterinary technicians, we take boards, uh, state boards and national boards just like uh, human doctors and nurses. Uh, the AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, uh, grants accreditation to uh, programs that meet their criteria and that accreditation is what allows us as graduates to sit for these boards. That was the most crucial uh, part of what I was looking for in a program and Penn Foster's program is AVMA accredited and that is the biggest facet that, that pushed me towards online education was that accreditation. Yeah, so one of the big questions that everyone has to decide, I mean most people who look for online schools are obviously using some sort of search functionality and the question is how do they make choices what's the decision-making hierarchy they use and one of the things we really affirm loudly to all of our st prospective students is that you really <coughs> need to look at accreditation as a factor that's particularly important because ultimately I think Erica just to pick up on your point the employer doesn't really care what the delivery platform was that you got your education experience what they care about is that it was cer it is certified by and accredited by whatever the institution of choice is in that particular sector like the AVMA relative to veterinary. Think that's fair? Absolutely. Great. So John, um, you talked about the challenges you've had through your life in education and um, here you are sitting and starting school again and you presumably needed some help along the way and so maybe talk a little bit about what is the role of faculty in your experience in a self-directed learning environment where you can kind of go at your own pace. How does that work? Well, I pretty much gave up on uh, even all attempts on furthering it, but uh, like the benefits from it was, like I said, the timing that I can do it in. Uh, you know, you don't have to go to lunch at a certain time. You don't have to be back at a certain time. You can take a break when you want to take a break. Uh, it gave me plenty of time to uh, really absorb what I was reading and what I was, you know, because that, that was the distractions that used to bother me out there. I can go in a room and shut the door and focus on what I'm doing. And when you did encounter challenges that even concentration and quiet and reflection didn't solve, then how do you progress? What's the role of the, of the actual teachers in that experience for you? Do you have access to them? Is yes. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. It's not just I just go in a room and I isolate or anything. I, I do. I study very hard. But I also know that, that, that I, I also need help. And, and big, one of the biggest problems I had with struggling was asking for help. And, uh, you know, so when I get to a point where I feel stuck or confused, I, I can pick up the phone. Uh, I go on the community website. And uh, I can type in the question, and you got all other students feeding back with the answers, and 
it's awesome. It's just great. And I can pick up the phone and call, call the uh, main office, and they all, always directed me to someone to help me uh, get through that. So, so, DJ, just to pick up on John's point about um, sort of the self-pace, why, why is self-pacing important for someone like you with your life as opposed to the traditional idea of showing up at a certain time and finishing a certain time? For me, it was really important to have the self-paced um, way to go because, like I said, I do work a lot. And w between that, like just going home and trying to attend an actual school would just be way too hard for me. It was a lot of strain and with my family just being able to go at my own pace, take my time, absorb what I'm learning, and know that I'm doing a good job in my studies because I had that was really, really good for me. Right, and the, um, not to dwell on the past, but because we're all about the present and the future, right. but since we have you here, uh, was it fair to say that as you were trying to go through your educational experience in traditional educational setting, and you had all these other life responsibilities that you had taken on, uh, because of your family situation, would you say that the traditional school was supportive of that, or would you say that they actually made a hard situation that much more difficult? Yeah, um, traditional school definitely made it a lot harder for me to go ahead and get my, even down to my, my high school diploma, it just wasn't possible because there was a time where in traditional school I was an A student, close to honor roll, and they would dock me grades for not being present at school, and it didn't matter what I was going through at home, they just saw, okay, this student's not here, they don't care, you know, so we're gonna take her A to a B, and then it went down to an F, and it was just like, you know, I, I can't win here, there's nothing I can do. Not with their standards, it's too rigid for me to progress. Right, so you then had to pivot to this new world where it's more self-paced. Yeah. Uh, as John alluded to, he uh, has built confidence in asking for help which is, I think, part of the transformation a lot of at-risk learners go through. In the traditional school setting, uh, somehow you're viewed as weak if you ask for help, and it's not an affirming environment. There's, the word hospitality never enters into the culture of education, and that's the mentality that I think that, uh, particularly for the at-risk student, uh, is important. They have financial risk, they have academic risk, and they have motivational risk. That's understood, and so the question is, how do you deal with that set of facts? In the traditional school setting, you're somehow viewed as uh, not mainstream and I, ironically actually a problem if those risk factors exist in your life. I think the, the better organizations that support the at-risk populations embrace that that is part of the reality of their environments and make that a positive affirmational part of the experience. Part of the way to do that though and do it efficiently, because ultimately economics matter a lot in this decision, is there has to be a delivery model that actually works for the student and economically. And so Erica, maybe you could talk about there's the role of the faculty, there's your own uh, self-discipline. What is the role of community and how does the community concept work and how does it work for you in the in the vet tech opportunity specifically? The community website that uh, the, the school offers is is a phenomenal tool. Um, dealing in, in my program in the veterinary technology program um, there are questions that, that, that come up and students as students we can we can post and get answers back rather than from faculty, uh, our peers answer our questions. And sometimes just hearing something put a different way, uh, put more into the terms of everyday use rather than using doctor words, so to speak, uh, it, it makes it easier to understand the concept of, of uh, the answer to the question that you have. Uh, the community allows that. Um, it's wide open, uh, every, it's, it's extremely helpful. You can post one question and, and within a couple of hours you've got pages and pages of answers and helpful suggestions and places to look up further in-depth research options. It's, it's an incredible learning tool and peer-reviewed, so to speak. And what about issues of um, academic integrity? Uh, there's obviously, in the traditional school setting, uh, it's completely unacceptable to, to plagiarize and to cheat. I would imagine in an online setting, especially if you're having a community-based approach, there could be lots of risk of that. So how does the academic integrity get maintained while taking the best advantage of the, of the crowd, if you will? The, the exams, the chapter exams, uh, they're, uh, it's all done online. Uh, I, honestly, I never even thought of trying to open two windows and ask, hey, anybody know the answer to this? But I, I, don't, I don't 
see how that, that would, would happen. The proctor exams, the big finals that we have, they are proctored, uh, they're monitored. There's, there's no way uh, to, to try to cheat anything. The integrity is, is very well withheld. With you our have exam the, process. The moderators on the, the community website as well to make sure that that stuff is not happening. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. So it's right. sort of self policing mm -hmm. uh, in terms of your own integrity. Then there's the, the community polices. Yeah. But then there's sort of randomized testing <coughs> that would be very difficult to sort of trick yeah. the system, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, so, so one of the things that you hear a lot about if you read education materials, which probably most of you in this room do, is you hear about this idea of the sort of student-centered learning. A and it's an interesting notion, but like, what does it mean in practical terms? And the practical aspects of it as we see it is that it's about self-directed learning. And the premise, which is a very different premise than traditional education, which presumes that the faculty is the source of knowledge and wisdom first. The model that we put forth says the first line of defense is yourself. And self-directed learning is self-serve learning. And just like you don't like to necessarily have a conversation anymore with a teller at a bank, you use an ATM, and you pump your own gas, we believe that people want to be empowered to self-manage their education. So self-directed learning starts with the individual. However, they don't have all the answers. That's why they're going through the educational journey. And so the next level up is actually peer-based support. And you've heard from Erica how the community empowers her to make choices and to have additional stimulation. And then the last line of defense is actually the faculty. So we've tried to invert the model from faculty first to student first and up the pyramid goes to the faculty. Well, the reason that's relevant is that ultimately affordability is an enormously important part of the conversation. And I'm going to ask the folks to comment on pricing and affordability and debt in a minute. Uh, but the affordability model can only work if you invert the delivery model so that the faculty costs are not as dominant a part of the equation as they are in traditional higher ed not to mention, obviously, the bricks and the mortar. And so uh, maybe one of you or two, feel free to pick. Tell us how you thought about the issues of economics, because you all have financial challenges like many of us do, and you had to pay to go to school. So how did that work? How did you think about that? Um, OK, I'll go first. Uh, well, going online, I already knew, was a lot cheaper than a traditional school. So that was already like number one for me. Um, it, the, the concern that I had, though, was that if a program was substantially cheaper than another program, I wasn't sure about the quality of it. And that ties into what my boss might think or any other employer that I would have about the school that I picked. Um, but it, none of that mattered because the, the education had a lot of quality to it, and I was able to take everything that I learned and implement that into my job and show my employer and even my other coworkers who were higher than me that you know, it was a good education that I received and I was able to use that and afford it and I didn't have to worry about a, a ton of you know, student loans or fees or debt because I was okay by the time I graduated. So there's about a trillion dollars, as everybody knows, of student loan debt, which is greater than credit cards and automobiles combined. Um, there are, uh, unfortunately, a lot of schools that take advantage of students who have vulnerabilities and put them into debt. So Eric, you were thinking about a associate degree, mm -hmm. which in traditional higher ed would be considered Title IV money, student loans. Correct. How did you think about that as a decision and ultimately what happened in your case? Uh, the, the ability to uh, still work, uh, being a single individual, having to work full time, and being able to have a for lack of a better term, a pay-as-you-go type program with, with online education, uh, it was uh, probably, uh, it was not, not even a second, it was a 1A part of my decision um, on how I could budget, bring it into my budget to be able to afford it. Um, it's, it's funny, uh, in, in my current position where I am with, with Auburn, uh, I deal with third and fourth year vet students every day, and my textbooks match their first and second years, when with textbooks being included in the tuition uh, with the program that I took. It's, it's, it, it really brings a smile to my face to see students walking through the hall. It's like, hey, that's my textbook. <laughs> so what you're saying, though, just to be clear, is that you entered an associate degree program mm -hmm. that was pay as you go, Correct. and you didn't have any student loan debt. No, and it really wasn't even an option to go into student loan debt because it was pay as you go. Mm -hmm. And if you had stopped along the way, which thankfully you didn't, 
uh, you would no longer have any other obligations. As opposed to traditional higher ed, that when you enter the class, you pay up front, and you know, good luck. And so the, the institution that they're attending argues that the cost of capital for the consumer is a lot lower than the cost of capital for the institution. And so why should the institution have all the money when the student is the one who typically has the greater burden? And so the programs that these folks are pursuing are pay-as-you-go and do not accept Title IV money and actually think that it is wrong to put people into uh, an exposed situation financially in the interest of just, quote, going to school. And so that's been Erica's experience and I assume uh, DJ as well. Is that fair? Yes. Great. So let's talk about the practical aspects of what it means to go to school. So we have a traditional notions, all of us in our heads, of you went to school and you might have a, you know, your high school in your head or maybe your college in your head. But when your schools, you go to class each day and you go to school each day, how does it actually work in your life? Like when do you study? How does it work? Do you go to the library? Do you do it in long duration, short durations? What's the pattern of learning? I would just do it anywhere. Um, on my lunch break at work, after work, in the morning, if I couldn't sleep at night, that'd be the perfect time to just open my books and study as much as I could. It really didn't matter. It just, it worked. I would even have other friends come over who were doing other programs at other schools, and we would just study together just to get that study time in. So if multiple students started at the same time, you and some other person, mm -hmm. but you had more or less time than that person, you can work sort of independently or asynchronously because you have time some days and not other days, and other students study other ways, right? Yes. yes. So I think that's an important premise of this design of education for the at-risk learner as well. They have a lot of complexities in their lives, and they need to be able to wrap the school around their lives, not their lives around the school. And so this idea of being able to decouple their path based on their mastery versus other people is an essential part of how it works. So John, in your case, um, what's your sort of weekly rhythm or daily rhythm of study and preparation? Uh, like I was saying earlier, a lot of times at night, uh, it's a good time for me. Uh, not only that, even at work, uh, I'd have to back up in order to explain that a little bit. Uh, what happened was where, where I'm employed as a substance abuse counselor, we uh, had a state inspection. And uh, part of the requirements was you had to have a high school uh, equivalency, and, uh, which I didn't have. And I've been with the company for many years and uh, for a long time. I have a lot of CEOs. CEUs, I have a lot of trainings, I, I have a lot of background as far as substance abuse goes. Uh, actually, I could even get my license if I had my high school diploma. That's how much time I got involved in it, and I got everything I need except the uh, high school diploma. And what happened, they had a state inspection, and, and you know, I was kind of, they didn't even want to tell me about it right away. Um, they wanted to come up with a solution first, and uh, they, they presented me with uh, the online education course and uh, then I went down to the office and they explained it all to me and they said I was very valuable to the company and they didn't want nothing. They do everything in their power to keep me there. And uh, what they did was they paid the full tuition uh, to the online program, high school diploma program, which is works very well for me because of the time. They said I can do it, you know, at work, I can do it at home, I can do it anywhere I want to do it and at my own pace and, and it's, it's working fine. And like I said, I only had the five electives left to do and I still have over a year. And if anything was to happen, here's the advantage that, that, that it's unbelievable. Uh, say if I, some, some tragedy happened or something and, and I got set back, you can pay like, a, I think it's $75 or something, extend it for another six months. I mean, where else can you do that? And, and you don't have to throw it all away. You don't have to feel like you did everything for nothing. Yeah. You know, it's actually possible to achieve your goals this way, and, and I, I think it's awesome. So, uh, I mean, each of you have remarkable stories, so it's like comparing things that are already re remarkable. Um, and John's a great case study of that. Uh, apparently, the, the rest of the community of people in our school believes that DJ's story is particularly poignant. Um, she's pretty humble, but uh, I would ask you to maybe help explain why you were recognized as the 2013 Graduate of the Year from a school with 100,000 students. What, what was your story that you think helped inspire other people? Okay. Um. Uh, like I said before, my mother, she struggled with addiction for much longer than I had thought. 
it turned out to be 25 years. And around about, I would say 12 was when I had to take over things in the household. And I got my first job at 16. I had to withdraw from high school because not being able to go, they were taking my grades away. And that's when I first had my introduction to online schooling because I found a online high school that I went with and then later found my online college. Uh, but I just think that, you know, seeing a young person with, you know, real goals, because even a lot of my friends, you know, they're not really doing anything with their lives and they're just comfortable being in their setting or they have their parents, you know, paying the way for them and they're just kind of blowing it all away. So seeing someone my age who is taking the initiative and really trying to fight for their future, I think is what most definitely resonated with the people of Penn Foster and the other students in the community. And, and, um, and why do you think you were so resilient? Why do you think you have such grit? I guess I'm hard-headed. <laughs> just, I don't know. Just the whole time growing up, I just saw like what my family was going through, and as much as I love them, you know, I I knew that that wasn't what I wanted for me, and not to be better than them. But you know, I had younger siblings, and I wanted to show them, you know, like this is what they can do, and inspire them as well as myself and my mother. She is actually clean now, and she's been doing fantastic and they're finally on their own so they're not leaning on me anymore but just watching them grow and having my mother tell me each day like you know you're the reason I'm doing this and it's just it's overwhelming because I didn't think it would go that far so. right so you now have a bigger responsibility than you do all your siblings and helping your family you're actually helping inspire other students to <laughs> figure out their own pathway um, John you talk about in your counseling life um, the power of example uh, maybe you could just comment because it seems like uh, TJ's an example of the power of example and how does that play into your thinking about approaching school and, and what it means to you? It plays a big part for me. Uh, it's, it's part of giving back as well. Uh, and not only that, by leading by a power example uh, helps, especially with the clients I work with. You know, uh, they know I'm no different than they are. In a, and they can achieve their goals and, and they're possible. And not only that is like, um, you know, like on the community website, I wrote an essay and the essay was, that's what made this all possible for me was an essay. I was in a writing part two and I had to do a personal uh, essay of myself and I wasn't sure and I almost was at the point where I was giving up at that point because you know, the distractions and everything sure. else. And then, you know, my son had moved out recently, so I went upstairs and I shut the door and, and I did it, you know, in a couple hours I did the essay. And and it, it was uh, education and addiction was my uh, essay. And uh, even writing that, I, I was surprised how that helped a lot of others as well. You know, uh, so much feedback from that. I, I posted it on the community website, and all the feedback coming. Just recently, like two days, two, three days ago, I believe, I was reading one, and it was this young lady. I mean, not a young lady, but middle-aged. She was like uh, 58 years old. She, uh, she was telling me how her son had a lot of struggles like I have, and the online course is working for him. And not only that, she also mentioned herself that she uh, it even inspired her to go for her, her bachelor's now and you know hearing things like that you know and just hey thanks for sharing it worked you know it, it got me back it got me going further in my education so I think that one of the things that uh, gets lost a lot is uh, there's a lot of analytical discussions around education and f pricing and technology and all those things are essential ingredients to making the sort of secret sauce work but what we see is the most important thing that an online experience gives to the at-risk population is confidence. The confidence is actually the greatest level of deprivation they have in their lives because there were life circumstances that are generally not of their making that put them in a situation that was not perfect and they've had to navigate through that and they haven't had people around them, as DJ's story would highlight, that has necessarily seen all the opportunities that many of the people in this room have had. And so what we try to do in the design of the experience, back to this notion of affirmational, hospitality-oriented, is we try to make it so that confidence is explicitly built into the design of the experience for the student. And that it's a sort of a, a virtuous circle where they have to get more confident, they get reaffirmed, that builds more confidence, then they help other people build confidence, 
And that's when you start to get the scale economies of confidence in education, not just the scale economies of efficiency and you know, digital technology. It's, it's the confidence quotient that we're trying to increase because we know that just like all of you in your life, the confidence is the cornerstone of why you've all been successful. And that's what we're trying to inculcate into the culture of the student experience as these folks obviously represent at a really uh, uh, uber level. Uh, Eric, maybe you could talk about, um, like anything in life, you have a set of assumptions when you start. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you don't know what you don't know. And one of the questions is, um, what, what have you learned about how to be successful that you were advising other people to be successful in an online experience? What are those essential ingredients that you've had to sort of learn the hard way to, to be so, uh, so good ultimately at what you've ended up doing? Not to repeat you so much, but confidence is the biggest thing yep. that this this uh, degree has has given me. It's uh, it's incredible. Uh, the, it's it's empowering to walk into a room and have that behind me that that this is what I know. I know this is this, and I know this is this, and put those two together, and it gives me that, and I know it. It's mine. I own it. <laughs> right. That's awesome. And so in the, in the, there's the sort of confidence is sort of a mindset. What about the very practical issues of how to navigate, how to study, how to be successful in the pure academic sense of a online? Because there is no structure, obviously, at least generally, in an online. It, it takes a lot of self-discipline. But for me, there were places where I bogged down. And I think anybody has had a, a course or two that they think, mm, yeah, right. Um, but for the most part, I mean, I, I kept kept the, uh, the 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 end goal in sight and just kept reaching. And uh, I it was I wanted it so bad that it made it easy. And I'm such a geek anyway <laughs> that. <laughs> In the best sense, yes. Yeah. In in some cases, it was it was difficult for me to stay on track because I would get distracted and start going off on tangents, kind of like I am now. So, so um, just to save you from yourself, although you. I don't think you were off on a tangent, um, DJ, what have you learned about how to successfully study and progress, just in the academic sense of, like, how to be a good student in an online setting? Yeah, um, I think the most important thing, uh, I mean, confidence is very good. You need that too, and the want to do it, but just trying your best to prioritize. You don't have to be perfect at it, but you know, you don't wanna get lost either. So, like I actually spent an entire 10 months not doing anything and hadn't noticed that I didn't do any coursework. And I was like, whoa, okay, so pay for the extension and got it done but yeah just making sure that you know okay you can go out with your friends just like any other college student but you know you do need to make sure you actually take some time to get the work done and you'll be fine great so, so uh, one of the questions that comes up a lot is that you know the, the newspapers in particular cover up online education the new york times has an article about online education seemingly almost every day at this point um, and so one hand it's becoming more mainstream to go to school online um, but you live in communities um, and have friends who've gone to traditional, to traditional school. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're like most of us, you're gonna, your friends are gonna have to come in and out of the education world to stay, stay relevant as the job markets change. So do you see them as thinking more pragmatically about going to school online? Is that a viable option to them? or are they I think so, yes. I've even had, um, a, just at my job alone, some of the therapists that work with the kids that I teach, they, they, you know, they know that I went online and they were asking me about it because they are going for their graduate degrees and it's, it's more feasible for them. Like they have families and other responsibilities that they can't just put down. So knowing that they have that as an option is great for them. So they're actually trying to pursue that. Great, and what are you, other two? Have, do you think that more of your associates are gonna be thinking about online education? And Oh, I, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they're 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 going to have to uh, at at some point. Um, laws are changing within my industry. Uh, rules and regulations are changing. Uh, there are certain things that you have to be a credentialed technician to be able to do anymore. Um, a lot of uh, people that I know from pra other practices I've worked, you know, it, it's. It, it, 
you ha you ha almost have to, and when they see what I have accomplished, I can see in their faces that they want to. So. Fair point. Um, so uh, maybe just a, a couple of final questions, if we could, and then open up the conversation to uh, uh, to, to the floor. Um, what uh, what other advice might you offer to people as they think about the choices they have to make in education? We've talked today about how faculty has to be in place to help you. Community would be helpful. Uh, good good affordability is important. Um, so what what are the sort of final things when your friends come to you and say, "What should I do with my life?" and how should I make choices? What, what kind of advice do you give them now that you've been through this journey yourselves? CJ? I would say go for it. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much it. I know the success that I've had with it, and I'm leaping into it again, going to another online college and trying to get my bachelor's degree, and I feel totally confident about it. Like, I'm not worried that, you know, an employer is not going to accept it. I'm not worried that it's going to be too hard for me. I know I can handle it and it actually took off a lot of pressure you feel in normal uh, traditional school situations. So if they wanted to do that, I would give them the heads up and just be like, you know, do it, don't look back. You, you know. So when you think about school in your future, you actually think about school as an online experience now. That's, that is yeah. your notion of what school is. Definitely, yes. Got it. And, and John, do you have any, uh, you still have some work to do, obviously, but once you achieve that milestone that you've been pursuing so, uh, so amazingly, is it your intent to continue to quote, go back to school again? Uh, do you see that in your future, or do you feel like this will be the, the milestone you needed? Prior to this, the answer would have been no, but now that, now that I, I, I realize that I can get over this hump that I, uh, I stu stumbled with for so long, you know, because of false pride, et cetera, and things like that, uh, you know, and, and I know it's possible now to follow through, and I, I'm just, you know, not too far away from it now. And yes, uh, you know, I had to question that uh, myself a couple of times because, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier that I have, I have all the uh, CEUs, I have the, uh, the time, I have the hours, and uh, I could actually just go for my uh, license and stuff after I get my uh, high school diploma. But um, I'm even going to hold off on that. I, I'm thinking of doing the online uh, counseling course and things like that and just brush up a little more and feel more comfortable before I actually do that test. I think it's worth it. I, you know, the more education, the more I got to offer others. And I said before, I like to be a power example, and, and it's helping me a great deal. It's a great story. Awesome. And Erica, uh, knowing a little bit about you as I do, my guess is you're not done with education. Oh, so absolutely not. Maybe you could comment on that. <laughs> uh, as far as advice goes, knowledge is never a waste. Uh, it, it just, it, to me, my best metaphor is, it, is that it's, it's a springboard. With, with this degree, it, it gives me opportunity, I can take it and I can jump and look into this and you know maybe get some accreditation in this field and then jump over here. It, to bring it back to Passport for Learning, it, it truly is a passport. It, it opens so many doors in so many different directions that you can spend the rest of your life learning and it's, it's incredible. Right, and I think that that really is the Ultimately, it's a perfect setup, Eric. It's the, I guess the summary of why we thought this talk today would be helpful to everybody. Uh, it's that we think that education is a passport for learning. Uh, it's empowered all of you to be as successful as you are in this room. Uh, for our population, particularly that we service, the 75 million Americans that have an associate degree or less, in some sense it's actually more important to them because uh, the employment opportunities they have are rapidly changing and for them to remain contemporary they're going to need to stay relevant in that employment market. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of having on-ramps and off-ramps that are affordable, self-paced, and flexible, that give you the right amount of academic support that works for you as a self-directed learner, that's sort of the game that we're pursuing. That's the end state. That's a design point. And um, we talk a lot about you get what you design for. And so the journey we're on is to try to build that design for the 21st century middle-skilled worker who needs to come in and out of that economy and can view the education opportunities as their passport for them empowering themselves and their families for better economic opportunity and hopefully greater self-actualization. And hopefully you've seen three amazingly representative samples 
of people today who've done that uh, against a lot of odds and obstacles and with a lot of reasons why they maybe didn't need to do it or couldn't do it, and they've taken control of their destiny, and it's, it's remarkable and it inspires, I know, ourselves at our organization and, and hundreds and thousands of our students and, and hopefully you. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we'd love to answer any additional questions and uh, hear any feedback. I think the way the process works is this very handsome gentleman in the middle of the room here uh, is going to grab a microphone. Yeah, sure. I, I'm not clear about the role of the faculty and your various experiences, and I'm and I'm curious about the kind of stick to itiveness of your fellow students, uh, and how how many how many people finish the programs that they start. Yep. Um, so maybe we can tag team on this. Uh, I'll talk about how it's supposed to work, and they can talk about how it actually works. Um, so in the how it's supposed to work model. Um, the premise of the way we've constructed the education experience for the student, as I've indicated, is this pyramid of self-directed first, peer-supported, then faculty. When you reach points where you feel like you need access to faculty, uh, because the obstacles you're encountering just are not surmountable by yourself, uh, the way our model works is that it's essentially unlimited access. And so if you want to have an email-based interaction, if you want to do text-based, maybe you want to attend some webinars, because we know where there are are speed bumps in each one of the courses and so you can attend the webinar on demand and hear more about why certain things work the way they work in the class or ultimately you can simply call and you have unlimited support and so the model is that um, what we have found it's somewhat counterintuitive to even the way no business works what people often think which isn't actually true anymore is that if you give people unlimited access to something they'll just take full advantage of it and somehow that would be a bad thing and you lose a lot of money what we've seen is the opposite, that once you tell people they have unlimited access, they will actually use it judiciously and selectively because they actually value their time more than they value anything else, which is right. And so the model we have is you have unlimited access to faculty who are experts in those domains that are relevant to your course. So Erica, as an example, maybe you want to talk about vet tech, mm -hmm. how it works, access to faculty. We have. Uh we have the capability to, uh, we can private email through our community page. Uh, phone conversations, we can always call in. Uh, for my particular program, uh, it was easier for me to a email my instructors who are DVMs in their own right. Uh, I would have answers back to my questions if it was something that I needed a little bit more in-depth. It wasn't just a black and white answer. There would be a time set up for me to actually call them. Uh, we have the ability on our webinars uh, for the various course presentations or class presentations. Uh, we hear the instructor. We, we see what they are presenting, but then we can also type in questions if we need clarification of something. Say we have a, a, a slide of a, of a round worm up. You know, we need to know you know, these are the characteristics, what we, what we need to be able to have in our heads to be able to recognize that. We can type in a question and that is answered immediately as soon as it pops up on our instructor's screen. So if you think about the Vet Tech program, which, which to be fair is one of the most exemplary programs that our, our, our organization offers, so it's a little bit of, we're talking about the best room in the house, so to speak. But, but it is representative of where we're heading. There's 8,000 students in the VET program. It's the largest VET program in the United States of any school. It has more AVMA graduates than any school in the United States. And what's notable about that, beyond the obvious outcomes that are pretty astounding, is that the bigger it gets, the better it gets because the, it's, there's a knowledge database. And it's unlikely that when you get to the 9,000th student who's enrolled, that they're gonna ask a question that some other student hasn't asked. And so the idea is the knowledge management system codifies the questions that people ask, and therefore as you type in, if you've done with Google, for example, and it starts to auto-populate, it will begin to auto-populate the question you have because other people have asked it. And so there's scale economies in terms of knowledge management, and once you answer that question once as a faculty member, 
then you can repurpose that. And so that's where you get the economies of scale <coughs> at, for the student and for the school, because it's self-serve first, peer serve second, faculty serve third. In regards to outcomes, at the institutional level, we graduate 28,000 students a year. We have the largest high school in the United States. We graduated 13,000 students out of our high school last year. I think one of the issues about outcomes management for at-risk populations is that traditional higher education is completely out of sync with the reality of serving that population. And so you know, if you live in Wellesley, Massachusetts, or in Scarsdale, New York, it's very interesting. It's very, not very difficult to talk about outcomes, because everybody has every competitive advantage they could have in their lives. If you serve at-risk populations and you apply traditional metrics, then you basically, it's a sort of a setup in effect, not out of malice, but just out of reality. So, so what we, we argue is that um, it's better to have started and failed than to have never started. That's first premise. And so what we argue is um, it's about your intent. So you look at our college programs, about half the people who attend our college intend to go to another school. That's their mission. They want to transfer to Penn State. They want to transfer to Syracuse. They want to transfer to Hobart. And so they never intended to graduate. They, they intended to arbitrage the economics of edu higher education, where our cost per credit is $78, and you know, the University of Phoenix is $500, and Hobart and Syracuse is beyond that. And so the answer to your question of, we have a commitment to drive progression and outcomes for the highest risk populations in the United States. The outcome scores are never as good as they are compared to the traditional metrics, but the students arrive with different risk factors. And until the education economy changes the how accountability gets measured, indexed for risk, we're always going to look like we're on the wrong side of the argument, when in fact, as evidenced by this conversation, we're actually doing more greater good for society in many respects than the traditional education institutions are, because we're serving an at-risk market with affordable programs that work for their lives, that empower them to take control of their destinies. And so our notion is what we call, our idea as, a, as an organization is what we call um, a purpose with a profit. Purpose with a profit. Our higher order purpose is to empower people to take control of their lives economically and to change the trajectory of their families. And the process of doing that, because we're a for-profit organization, we make money doing that but we don't do it by putting people into debt. We do it by delivering value, and as they go through that journey, they pay and they earn the opportunity to change the future of their lives. Thank you all for sharing your, uh, your stories and experiences. Uh, I'm curious about uh, how you chose Penn Foster, specifically, you know, what are, how many other schools did you look at and, and what stuck out about Penn Foster? How is it different? Good question. DJ, you want to go take that? Yeah. Uh, I actually was, like, um, I wasn't looking at college. I did not think it was even going to be possible for me to go to college. But uh, the people I worked for at the time, they were really adamant about me trying to further my academic career. And so I just, I like computers anyway, and I knew I was working full time. So I decided, OK, maybe I will go ahead online and look at some schools. And I spent many nights. I don't, I don't even know how many schools I looked at. but just. Lots of nights of staying up, looking at everything that was on the website, looking at their accreditation, and just seeing like, okay, what's going to be okay for me in Pennsylvania? Is this going to stick? You know, how much is it going to cost? And it was between this institution and another school, and just looking at you know their credibility that they had, checking out what they had to say on the web about the school and all that. You know, it all just looked really good. They had the exact program that I wanted, and I felt confident that it was going to be a good outcome. So that's how I let, was led to Penn Foster. Uh, John, you want to just briefly talk about, because I know your employer played a very active role in helping to provide you a short list of options, right? Yes. Uh, like, like I said, it was, I, I needed to get it. And uh, so I, I didn't have no, they, they, they paid my full tuition right from the get-go. So I didn't have no issues as far as that went. Uh, they supported me a great deal. And, uh, but the benefit from that, you know, I, I was still, I was still nervous about being able to follow through. And, uh, you know, you were saying earlier about the d different uh, curriculum and stuff like that. And, uh, but like, for me, I'm, I'm still learning like some of the online stuff, you know, like 
uh, as far as the technical stuff goes, you know, and I just said I had to, I took five electors, three of them's on computers, installing, keyboarding, just so I can, you know, because that's, that's the way things are going today, and, I, and I'm like a literate when it comes to that stuff, so, but I, I've been getting a lot of experience lately just by emailing and, you know, coming here and stuff like that. I'm getting better at it. But not only that, like the books I had, like I said, I need to focus on my own time sometimes and read it and comprehend it. And when I'm reading these books, it, it explain, you know, when I, it, it's almost like they knew when you're gonna be at a stuck point or something, you know, it's like, it, it's unbelievable. It's like, when I, when I thought I was stuck, I opened up the book again and I look and it said there's like, there's three types of learning, three types of learners, you know, and one's like, uh, uh, hands-on and, and etc and it explains all this and then I can identify the one I related to and I was able to move on to the next step it's a, it's awesome it's laid out really good so so two points uh, one is uh, in, what John uh, didn't explicitly say is his employer helped down select to two and then they got on a call with John and the in this case the admissions team and his employer and they did their due diligence on a call and decided that, that was a good option John alluded to the fact that we while we don't have you know, 21st century adaptive learning capabilities, there is enough data on ret retent retention and attrition curves where you can anticipate where there's gonna be obstacles and at least try to take preemptive steps sort of as a cohort, not an individual that says, you're bound to have a challenge as you enter this next step in, you know, exam three, here are additional resources available for you that you can, again, self-empowered to try to, try to overcome those. Uh, other questions, please? Thanks so much. I'm just amazed. Uh, hats off to you, Frank, for the leadership and the three of you. Bravo. Um, this is inspirational. This is very validating for a lot of the things that we believe uh, are great about for profit. I say we, my partner, my colleague here, Scott. Um, I've been in higher education for eight years, traditional and for profit, a son of an educator, so I'm a big believer in public education, but I see the disconnect with traditional, as you eloquently articulated. So some things that we're thinking about as service providers is, um, I think you alluded to it, Frank, when you talk about, and I, unfortunately, when someone transfers, it sometimes is measured as a dropout, so it counts against you, and until the measuring metrics are, are more uh, uh, objective or, or, or right size, I guess you're always gonna be at a disadvantage. Yeah. That said, do you feel like, do you, do you, do you talk about re the word retention? And do you, do, and, then, and then whoever wants to answer, and then the three of you, do you think about how your faculty, your instructors, as well as let's say, I don't know if you have a, a bona fide student service area, do you think about how they communicate with you and how you, do you think of ways that it could be better? Are there potential ways that you can improve upon communication? And again, both, both sides, I'd love to hear your opinion on how to achieve higher retention. I know it's so cliche to say that, yeah. uh, but I'd like you to comment on it if you could. Well, I think uh, we use the word progression, uh, not retention. Pro progression is what the student is experiencing, if successful. Um, I think that we are going through a transitional moment, even though we've always been a self-directed learning model, but when you put in place, for example, a Jive social platform, which is you know, arguably one or two uh, leader in social collaboration, and you impose that on a school that was once a correspondent school, there is quite a bit of disruption in the enterprise relative to making that come to life. I think what we have seen is that um, we've only scratched the surface on progression improvements, and um, we know that it, the idea that there's sort of one type of at-risk learner is not true. There are different pathways that different students need. Where we have got a lot of progress is we can anticipate where the risks are going to be. So we know what factors. So for example, in our high school, we know the risk factors for a 13 to 17 year old attending our school who transfers a certain number of credits are completely different than a 25 year old. And so I think what we're moving towards is not a personalized learning, but a pathway model within, say, the high school or within the VET program where we can anticipate the risk factors that person has in their life, financially, motivationally, and academically, and try to tailor experience for them so that they can progress. Uh, and the, the thing about our business that we love a lot is that it's perfectly aligned interests financially because we will not earn our dollars from our student if they do not progress. Whereas in traditional higher ed, because of the cost of capital equation, which is completely backwards, 
the school gets all the money, the student puts on all the risk. If it doesn't work out, the student's stuck with the bag and the school goes on to the next student. And so we feel like you need to align fundamentally progression with economics and our design of our business allows that to happen. Do you see ways that the UC for profit helping tra the traditional uh, side uh, adopt areas of best practice and philosophy? Do you see one day there being a, a kinder, gentler uh, middle ground of the two sectors uh, figuring out how to uh, you know, cross-pollinate? Well, we, we think that uh we think that for-profit schools in the last decade have really pioneered innovation, and that's required the traditional schools up their ante. I think a lot of the traditional schools have up their ante. You know, Southern New Hampshire University is in every respect a for-profit institution with the exception of their tax status. And, you know, their marketing budgets reflect that, the analytics they put in place, the technology. And so I think that, I think that is not a primary factor. We do a tremendous amount of research with our consumers. The at-risk population and the non-traditional student has no idea of the difference between a for-profit school and a not-for-profit school. That's just rhetoric that's in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And so what matters from the student's perspective, as you heard today, is can they capture the value that they need from the program, which is the flexibility, affordability, and employability. And if they get those three things aligned, it's, it's lights out and it works for them. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. You guys have anything to add to that? No. no. <laughs> Thank They're you. very kind. Thank they you. let Good me job. speak. So it, it work, it's working for me. That's, I know that. So. We have about uh, five minutes left, so maybe we'll take two more questions. Is that okay? okay. And then gentleman wrap it up. Yeah. Sure. After yeah. this yeah. one. Great. This gentleman is very kind, so you'll be sure to get your question answered. We promise. Okay. Yeah, um, been up there for a while. I too would like to say thank you. I know stepping out of your comfort zone, coming to Austin, sitting in front of this group of unknowns, <laughs> and telling your story that that takes a lot of courage and confidence. So thank you for sharing. Um, with regard to the community pay, community-based effort that you spoke of, mm -hmm. I'd like to drill in a little bit more because that's extremely interesting and uh, non-traditional. So if you don't mind, from your perspective, that first kind of community-based experience that you guys might have experienced along your curriculum, if, if you could maybe shed some light on what that was like um, so the from what I've gathered, there's a community-based element and then the faculty jump in at a certain point. Do you have mm -hmm. any stories that you could at least share one or two that, that might have been your experience of that community-based piece of the puzzle? I'd love to gain some more you insight on like that. You mean like the community? Uh, start start the community yeah. so, in general. So, so, oh, DJ, maybe <laughs> you can talk about how the community has played a role. In, yeah. Uh, just like a like we all said, whenever we get stuck and we go, we get to we have the opportunity to just jump in and go in the community. It's not like you have to worry about hours or anything like that because students are up at all times. You know, we're all in different programs across the you know state and country. So, if you have a question and you are stuck, you can ask someone and they can answer you right away. And you guys can connect on that front, and it's it's like instantaneous. So it's really good for you because you don't feel like, oh my God, I can't get this done. I don't know what the answer is. Blah blah blah, whatever. So you don't, you don't have that worry. And I'm an avid Facebook user, so it's just like transferring from that. Instead of my Facebook friends, I have this community of other students who are all gonna work together and help me and I can help them. And it just goes back and forth. So in Erica's case, the, the fellow who's the course chair is a very big personality guy. Uh, he's a vet by background, he's run vet at Dr. Jim, as he's called. Uh, and he's Lovingly. sort of the voice and the personality of, the, of that community of 8,000 people. Obviously, if you're in the vet program, you have a lot of passion for animals. That's sort of a common trait. So maybe you could talk about how that comes to life in the community. My first experience with the community page, as far as for the veterinary technology program, Dr. Jim brought that uh, when he started uh, being department head. Um, it was... For somebody who remembers when there wasn't an internet, uh, the whole Facebook type social media thing is, I'm still somewhat apprehensive about it, not being much of a social butterfly anyway. Um, but just when Dr. Jim opened that community page, it, it it's incredible because like, like Frank said, I mean, Everybody who's on that page wants to be there. We're there for our passion for animals and our passion for learning and being able to combine the two to provide the best that we can. Uh, 
it, the, the amount of help, everybody chimes in, uh, faculty, Dr. Jim, uh, you know, th there's always a, a correct answer. It's always marked on, on any question, no matter what the subject matter. Um, it's, it's a support, it's a, it's a net that, that is under us that when we, when we need help, we can go to this and we get our answers and it's friendly, there's no flaming. Uh, again, it's everybody wanting to help each other. We all want to succeed and we kind of somehow intuitively know that in order to do that, we need, to, we need each other and that community provides that type of support. All the lessons you've learned about how to make the world a better place comes to life in the best sense in a community contact. We have ambassadors who are students in those programs who are further catalysts and um, it, it works. We have one final question and we'll be mindful of time because we know that there's other people coming. So please. Yeah, good morning. I, I work for a nonprofit that focuses on adult literacy and I just had a quick question on uh, a number of the adult learners that we work with uh, are low-income households. Their only access to the internet is their smartphone. Yeah. I was just curious for the students, um, your online learning, has it had to be on a, a computer or tablet or can you actually do it on a smartphone phone, or is that format just too small? I have actually been at work at certain times when I needed to take an exam or a study, and you can, like, you can use it on your phone. I can attest to that. Sometimes I just don't want my computer around with me. And yeah, that's totally possible. What we found is we've done a lot of research on this and that for certain uh, income strata that we service, they don't have, uh, they, don't, they can't afford um, internet access, so their phone is their, is their internet. And so responsive design, of course, is foundational to having the right dynamic user experience, and we've embed that in the experience for the student. And um, the phone is the epicenter of their lives, and so that's what we've designed for, the phone. Um, in the cases where they don't have that access either, uh, they can obviously still use you know libraries and things like that. One of the markets we're trying to navigate better is um, incarcerated youth and incarcerated adults. Uh, we do business today with 32 prisons. Uh, different states have different laws regarding internet access and intranets, and we think that's an incredibly important market to help serve, and it's an extension of the population that we have already historically successfully served, and uh, we think that's another big area of opportunity that we're trying to navigate to your point. Um, so I think we've uh, run out of time, uh, but we haven't run out of inspiration. Uh, I think that you got a pretty good sense of what these guys are all about, and we really appreciate your interest in joining us today, and we're happy to answer any other questions offline. Thank you. Thank you.